Hogan Gidley, as I mentioned earlier, was the deputy press secretary uh, during the Trump administration. He is now serving as a vice chair for election integrity at America First Policy Institutes, making sure that states are being held accountable and we don't see a lot of that mm, little shenanigan stuff that we saw last time in 2020. Hogan's on the case. Um, also joining us, Amber Athey. She is a really active and effective voice in the conservative world right now. And she is also the Washington editor of The Spectator and the host of Unfit to Print at WCBM. Let's get into it. Come on in, panel. Amber Hogan, good to see you both. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for having us. All right. Appreciate so we, uh, I want to start with the primaries. Let me just ask this because I, I want to talk to you about impeachment and spending and that. But where do you think the state of the race is as we get ready for the second debate next week? Hogan, I'll start with you. Well, look, Sean, I think you and I have done a lot of these over the years, uh, and I've never seen anything like this in my life, to have a front runner that's so far ahead, in large part because he's running on things he's actually accomplished as president, right. not as a governor, not as a senator, or promises he would do uh, if he got elected to the White House. He can say, I did them once, I can do them again, and his lead continues to expand. And there was a time there after those midterms where it kind of got closer, a little dicey, 15, 20 point range, 10 points. And then next thing you know, it went, started going back out. And, and Donald Trump's still ahead uh, by 40, 50, 60 points in some polls. And yeah, some people are like, no, these polls wouldn't be accurate in states, blah, blah, blah. But they're not 40 or 50 points wrong. Right. So it has been a shocking thing for me to witness someone just kind of take hold, a stranglehold of the, of the field and say, no, you're coming with me. I've done this before. I'll do it again. And while everyone else is running in that I'm Trump's policies without his personality lane. I would argue it's his personality that got the policies. And so a lot of people look at that and go, with all these investigations into American citizens and the weaponizations of three-letter agencies, we need somebody to go in there and throw some elbows. And we know Donald Trump did it once, and now he knows where the bodies are buried. So send him back and let him do it again. Amber? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I don't see any major shakeup happening in the primary right now that could possibly significantly cut into that massive lead that the former president has built up. And I think Hogan hit on something important there, which is as much as people say that they don't like Trump's personality, I'm not sure how true that is. <laughs> because actually, when you talk to, I mean, especially people who support him, They'll say, well, I could do without the tweets. But then when they see the latest tweet and it's something hilarious or they watch these moments of him, you know, on the tarmac reacting live to RBG's death and he takes the pause to collect himself, those types of things they actually really love. They kind of like the uh, the showmanship of the presidency that that he had. Um, so I think the personality does matter. And, and the personality is part of that fighter persona that they really like, too. And when they see this, these indictments, as Hogan said, right, this is something that resonates with them because now under the Biden DOJ, you're seeing them actually turn their sights on everyday Americans. You're seeing them turn their sights on pro-life activists, on school board parents, on people who are doing nothing but uh, talking about right-wing politics online. And then the FBI jumps in and tries yep. to manufacture a plot to kidnap the Michigan governor. So they see what's happening to Trump and they see what's happening to the average American and they're able to put two and two together and say, oh, my gosh, that that could happen to me. So yeah. let me ask you, I, I get this. Uh, and Hogan, I'm sure you get it as a former Trump guy. Uh, Amber, you, um, I, I'll be interested in what your take is, too, obviously. But um, I, I get asked almost extensive, like, will Trump debate? Should he debate? I've said it very clearly. I mean, he's so far ahead that it doesn't make political sense. You can want him to debate. I think it would be entertaining to Amber's point. He's a great showman. I think that he would have like 18 lines that would have us rolling. Um, but I don't know why from a strategic standpoint, it doesn't make sense. And the only caveat that I've made is, as we get closer to say Iowa, if it had gotten down to one or two people and they were growing their lead, uh, I could see a case to say, hey, give people something to, to look at before Iowa. Barring that, if you're still 40, 50 points up, like Hogan was noting, why would you do, why would you show up? Hogan, do you agree, disagree? I, I'm in, I mean, look, I, I don't work for any of these candidates right now. Obviously, I don't work for Trump. Uh, but personally, I love debate night when you're not on a campaign. When you're yeah. on a campaign, it's the worst night uh, <laughs> ever other, other than election night because you're always having to react in real time and get all these things ready and prepare and all this. Um, and then go into the spin room and the whole thing. Uh, but as a consultant, 
it would be a dereliction of duty for me to go to a person who's up 40, 50, 60 points and say, I think it'd be a good idea for you to go onto a debate stage where every single person up there wants your job and they're going to try and attack you to get to the position you're in. Now, look, there's a big rung on this ladder here to get all the way to the top where Trump is. And you can't just jump five or six or 10 or 50 rungs to get there. you got to climb over each person that's kind of where you are to, for it to happen. But make no mistake, they'd go after Trump and they'd do it hard. At least some of them would. And we know Chris Christie's one of those folks, for example. It would be political malfeasance for me to say, hey, go up on that debate stage. I think he's doing the right thing from a strategic standpoint. Amber? I completely agree. I mean, there's no reason that he should be debating right now from a strategic standpoint. It doesn't do him any favors. The only thing that could happen is he gets on that stage and the other candidates gang up on him and manage to get enough shots in that maybe they pull him down by a few percentage points. And that's not a big deal in the long run, considering how much of a lead he has. But why would you subject yourself to that? And, um, you know, it's it's what like what you said, Sean. I want to see him debate. I'd love for him to be on that stage. Yeah. But from a political strategy standpoint, it doesn't really make any sense. And I also think that the moment he does decide to debate, if he ever does throughout this primary process, that is going to indicate weakness because that's going to indicate that he's scared of the other candidates and he feels like he has to debate because his lead is potentially shrinking. And you know that's exactly the narrative that would be run with by the media as soon as he decided to participate. So I think it's smart, especially what he's doing in this uh, next iteration. He's going to give a speech in Detroit. Uh, uh, you know, during this historic UAW strike, trying to speak to that labor coalition that he broke through in yep. 2016. That's the smart play here. No question. Brilliant, too, by the way. Brilliant move for him to do that. I mean, to talking right to the people and not getting bogged down with all the nonsense, going to that base, the people that are supposed to be in Joe Biden's corner. Yeah. You know, they were promised all of these great policies from Joe Biden. And this EV nonsense is crippling that industry. They're ripe for the picking, and it's good for them to do it. So let me ask you a question. You, you, Kogan, you brought up the UAW, or I'm sorry, Amber, you brought up the UAW speech. He did Tucker last time. He did the UAW. Let's just say hypothetically, tomorrow, the UAW strike gets solved. So we take that off the table. And he calls each of you, and he says, Hogan, it's the president. Uh, kidding. That was a bad one. And That's um, a great one. And, and he <laughs> says, okay, they, they, what else? I did Tucker last time. I was going to do the speech. Um the, the strike is solved. What should I do? What what else would you or maybe the third the third debate? What else could he do? Because I think, you're, you know, he's been such a master at sort of sucking the oxygen out of the room. What 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 else is on the table, you think? Well, right now, I think even if it gets solved, it's still worth him going there because those people feel like they're on shaky ground because the environmentalist, the radical Green New Deal stuff isn't going to stop. It's going to get more invasive, right. uh, more rules, more laws, more regulations, uh, more cries to stop the internal combustion engine, which, by the way, would destroy the world's economy. 